Well, I'm going to do the talk which I did on Sunday again because we had some problems on Sunday with the recording and with the transmission. I'm going to do it uh, firstly to do the Bible study which I did on Luke 17. And then we're going to do the uh, Signs of the Times talk this month in Prophecy which will include uh, some of the material I put in the talk on Sunday which will be in the second talk we're going to do on the Signs of the Times. So we're going to read from Luke 17 verse 20 to 37, and share a few thoughts on that. Luke 17, verse 20 to 37. Now when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look here or look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by that, this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he, he, was on the, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Praise the Lord. This uh, prophecy in Luke comes uh, at a time when Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees and he, they were questioning him, putting some questions to him with some hostility. Basically, if you understand the thoughts behind it, they're really saying to him, Put up or shut up. Show us that you are the Messiah or keep quiet. Show us the visible kingdom of God, the restoration of the kingdom to David, deliverance from the Roman occupation, make Israel a free nation under God, then we'll believe you're the Messiah. And so Jesus begins with a discussion of the nature of the kingdom of God. And in this passage, you read, he has a word for the Pharisees and for the disciples on this subject. Uh, if you follow the scripture, you'll know that it's parallel to the passage in Matthew 24, verse 36 to 44, where he has similar material. In the Matthew uh, account, it comes in the course of the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus is answering the questions about his second coming from the disciples. And it comes after he's given the signs of his second coming. Uh, here in Luke, it actually comes before the Olivet Discourse passage, which is in Luke 21 in Luke's Gospel. Uh, and it seems that Jesus is actually giving this teaching on a different time and a different occasion uh, from the Olivet Discourse passage in Matthew 24. And of course, Jesus as a teacher can give the same teaching on more than one occasion. Uh, when we look at what Jesus says here, he says to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Uh, by that, it, Jesus means it's not something you're going to see visibly, like a king sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, or a manifestation of the power of God, uh, resulting in the restoration of David's throne and Israel as a free nation under God. Uh, Israel freed from the domination of Rome. What he says is that the kingdom of God is within you. The word which is used in Greek is entos, which means inside. Uh, the translation is here correct. It says is within you. Some say it could be is among you. And of course, at the time when Jesus spoke these words to the Pharisees, he was there 
<coughs> as the king, representing the kingdom of God, bringing the kingdom of God to the earth. So he was there among them, with them. Uh, in a short period of time, he would go to the cross, die for our sins, be buried, rise again from the dead, <coughs> then appear to the disciples for 40 days, then ascend to heaven, after which he would send the Holy Spirit upon the disciples at Pentecost and begin the church age in which the kingdom of God really would be within them, be manifested in them, those who receive Jesus as saviour. Uh, kingdom of God within you speaks about an invisible change taking place in the life of the believer who believes on the Lord Jesus. As we come to faith in Jesus as saviour, who died on the cross, rose from the dead, we are born again to new life, enter into the kingdom of God as we believe in Jesus. But first, before that's going to happen, Jesus says to the disciples here in verse 25, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus reminding them once again that the way into this kingdom is going to come through the cross, through his suffering, through him going to the cross to die for our sins, then being buried and rising again from the dead on the third day, giving the victory over sin and death and hell and new life, which is available to all who believe in him, who repent and believe and accept Jesus as saviour. And those who do this are going to have the victory over sin, over Satan, over death and over hell. And that Holy Spirit who will come as a result of this is going to be dwelling in the believer. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. John 14, 16 to 18. And as the Holy Spirit comes to us, there'll be an inward change in the life of the believer. Uh, he'll change us from the person we were before we came to Christ to the person who he, he wants us to be. And that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Romans 14, verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, not something visible, as it were, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Spiritual things which come to us as we believe in Jesus and receive his righteousness, receive his peace, and receive joy in the Holy Spirit. This saying in Luke 17 has been misinterpreted by some who would take kind of a new age or a yoga or occult view of God. They would say that the kingdom of God is within you is something which is already there, that the kingdom of God is there within you. Your problem actually is that you don't know it, and therefore by doing some kind of meditation or yoga, you can discover the kingdom of God within you. God dwells within you as you. In fact, a man called Swami Muktananda, who's a yoga teacher, Hindu mystic, uh, one of his sayings is, kneel and worship yourself, God dwells within you as you. In other words, you're a little God. And the purpose of uh, enlightenment, as it were, is to discover your own godhood, discover that you're God already. And uh, <clears throat> that's actually a strong delusion, a deception, because God doesn't dwell within us until we accept Jesus as Saviour and are born again of the Holy Spirit. In the natural, unsaved, unregenerate person, the true knowledge of God is absent. Uh, and if you discover any supernatural power within you, apart from Jesus, that power is actually going to be a demonic power. And it's going to lead you not to truth and to light and to understanding, but actually to deception and to strong delusion. Apostle Paul said about himself, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. There dwells a sinful human nature. That's what I need to be liberated from by accepting Jesus as Saviour and believing on his name. And God dwells within us by the Holy Spirit when we call upon the name of Jesus and repent and believe the gospel. When we receive him into our lives, not from inside, but from outside. Uh, <clears throat> we have the picture in Revelation of Jesus standing at the door and knocking and asking to be let into our lives and to come into our lives and to dwell with us. And we have the image in John 3 about being born again. When Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 1, we read, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And to become children of God, we have to receive Jesus and to be born again by his Holy Spirit. If we reject him, we don't have this life in us and we're lost. 
Now, the Pharisees who are in opposition to Jesus don't have this experience, and they won't have it unless they repent and believe. The disciples who are following Jesus and believing in Jesus will have it. In fact, the Pharisees can have it if they repent and believe, and the most famous Pharisee, of course, is the Apostle Paul, who uh, had that dramatic conversion experience on the Damascus Road, who wrote so much of the New Testament, and who was himself a Pharisee who came to believe in Jesus. And in Acts chapter 15, it says about the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Uh, they did believe in Jesus. Acts 21, it speaks about many religious who believed. Uh, whether they were Pharisees who believed in Jesus is not quite clear, but it seems that there was uh, many who did believe in Jesus from that background. And any person who believes in Jesus, whatever background they come from now, whether they were religious or non-religious, whether they were very wicked or just moderately uh, sinful, can all have that experience by believing in Jesus and having him to change us from the outs inside uh, and give us new life. And of course, we're still the same person in the same body that we're changed from within. And we have a different destiny. We're going to be with the Lord in heaven and not in hell. Now, Jesus implies, as he goes on in this passage, that in this time, in this age, we're not to look for a physical reigning kingdom. He says, when they say, look here, or look there, don't go after them. Uh, and if someone says there's a specific place where you're going to find the kingdom of God, uh, you can be sure it actually won't be there, because the kingdom is available to everybody, anywhere in the world. All we have to do is to come to Christ and believe in him wherever we are. Uh, and in fact, when the church does end up trying to build a physical kingdom in this world, it ends up in error. Uh, we have great church buildings, uh, and of course, the church building which we have here is useful to have it but it's not the church in the true sense of what the bible says the church is the true church is the ecclesia which is a greek word which means those who are called out so those who are called out of the world to believe in jesus who are the people not the building and if you go to rome you can find some magnificent buildings which have been built to the honor of the roman catholic church uh, you have the vatican city you have the pope sitting on a throne in rome uh, giving himself the title Pontifex Maximus, which is a title actually taken from the Roman Emperor, means the Supreme Bridge Builder. It was a title which the Roman Emperor himself took, uh, and it signifies the uh, power and the omnipotence of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly in the Middle Ages when it ruled over the kings of Europe. And it established a Christian, in inverted commas, empire, known as the Holy Roman Empire which somebody said was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. But as it set up this physical kingdom, as it were, it became apostate, and it ended up suppressing the true gospel. So Jesus says, don't look for a physical manifestation of Christianity. Look for the new birth. Look for Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, in our time, we have another movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, which aims to uh, Christianize the world through signs and wonders which they hope are going to bring the whole world to faith in Jesus and bring about the great revival, out of which will come a Christianized world. And when we've succeeded in Christianizing the world and ruling the world, then Jesus will come back and sort of wrap it up because we'd have done the work to make the world Christian. If you read the Bible, the kind of prophetic teaching which I give, you know that that's not going to happen. That as we get nearer to the second coming of Jesus, the world's going to go not to Christianity, but to Antichrist. And if you're believing that you're going to triumphantly rule over the world and set up a physical, physical, visible kingdom, then you're actually leading to delusion and false prophets and false teachers. Nevertheless, when we look through this passage in Luke 17, we find that Jesus does not rule out a physical, visible manifestation of the kingdom. He connects this to the second coming, his second coming. And as believers, we have to wait and see wait till then to see it. And of course, those who were actually listening to Jesus have long been dead and have not seen the physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. And indeed, Christians who have looked for the second coming of Jesus have, up until our time, not seen it. I believe we're living in a very significant generation where we're seeing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy so that we may see the fulfillment of these things taking place in our time. Nevertheless, those who were believers in Jesus, uh, according to my understanding will be resurrected and will be part of the events which will take place at the second coming of Jesus. So they will actually see it. 
uh, and be part of those armies in heaven who come with Jesus when he returns to the earth at his second coming. But in the meantime, Jesus says uh, there will be this invisible kingdom. First, you have to have the inward change, the kingdom of God within you. Then will come the visible, visible change when Jesus returns. And he refers here to the lightning flashes from one end of heaven <coughs> to the other. And you'll find that this image is used also in Matthew's Gospel, in the parallel passage in Matthew, where Jesus speaks about the, uh, the darkness coming upon the earth, the sign of the, the uh, sun and the moon not giving their light, and the stars falling from heaven. And then the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven. And the sign of the Son of Man appears to be this uh, brilliant light of the Shekinah glory of God as Jesus comes back uh, in power and glory and that this will be a visible sign to that generation. And uh, Jesus is relating this to his second coming. And so he tells the disciples uh, who'd heard him speak about the kingdom of God within you, that the day is going to come when they will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but will not see it. But they will see in the end of days his coming in power and glory at the end of this age. And there's a time coming at the end of this age when there will be a visible manifestation of the kingdom, as Jesus speaks about here in Luke's Gospel. And it's associated with the second coming of Jesus. In Matthew 24, we have a passage where he speaks about it and says that uh, it'll come uh, visibly. Matthew 24, verse 27 <clears throat> As the lightning flashes from the east and comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And he says, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there will be this phys physical, visible coming of the Son of Man with power and great glory. And it's an event which Jesus says is going to happen. So although he's saying not now, you won't see it happening now, he's not saying not never. There will be a physical, physical coming of the Lord in power and glory. Now we see also when you read through this passage that he speaks about an event which uh, appears to be slightly different from this. He says that as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Speaks also about Lot. Likewise as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And he goes on to say that uh, uh, in, I tell you in that night there'll be two men in one bed one will be taken, the other will be left two women will be grinding at the mill one will be taken and the other left two men will be in the field one will be taken and the other left uh, so Jesus speaks here about an event which is going to take place which is parallel to something which happened in the days of Noah and the days of Lot in which one will be taken and one will be left uh, so what do we understand by this? Uh, and I believe this actually points to the fact that the second coming of Christ is going to be in two stages. First of all, the stage in which he will take those who believe in him to be with himself, and then the stage when he will come visibly to the earth with the saints to the earth at the end of this age. It says it's going to be as in the days of Noah and Lot. So if you look in the Old Testament, uh, Genesis 6 through to 9, uh, Genesis 18 to 19, you see that the days of Noah and the days of Lot had two things in common. Both of them <coughs> referred to events which took place uh, in the book of Genesis when God's judgment hit the earth and when God redeemed and took out of the way those who were righteous, those who were redeemed and were saved and took them out of the way before the judgment fell. We see also there was an event which took place when life was going on as normal and one was taken and one was left. So why Noah and Lot? Well, these were both situations of great wickedness on the earth when God 
brought judgment upon the earth. Genesis chapter 6 says that the Lord was sorry that he'd made mankind because of the great wickedness that there was on the earth. It says every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, and the earth was filled with violence. Uh, you can see that there are some parallels between that time and our time. And we see uh, our time as a time in which there is also great wickedness on the earth. And the human race is storing up judgment, and that is going to come upon the earth in the time of the Great Tribulation, uh, leading up to the second coming of Jesus to the earth. In the book of uh, in Genesis chapter 19, we see the passage about Sodom, a place of great wickedness, great sexual depravity, violence. See the appalling incident where the angels, two men, go into Sodom. Lot takes them into his house, and the depraved homosexual mob stands around the house saying, let, let, me, let us know these men who have come to you. In other words, let us have some kind of homosexual rape which will take place against these men. And that is enough to show God that this city is beyond redemption, as it were. It's reached the point of wickedness, which the only thing which God can do is to bring judgment upon it. And the angels tell Lot to take him, himself and his family out of the city before the judgment falls. Interesting, when Lot actually tells his uh, son-in-laws about this, they see, it says that to their eyes he seemed to be joking and they don't take any notice. And you can say that's also parallel when, with our time when we tell people to uh, believe in Jesus and to be saved from the wrath to come. Most people think it's a bit of a joke and they don't pay attention. But the wrath did come. The, the fire did fall upon Sodom. The flood came upon uh, the time of, on the world in the time of Noah. And all those who were outside of the ark were, saved, were lost. Those who were inside the ark were saved. Those who were in the city of Sodom when the judgment fell were lost and were destroyed. Those who came out of Sodom were saved and had, were able to continue their life. And there was a call to escape for your lives, escape from the destruction that's coming. And Noah and Lot and their families were saved in that day. So there are parallels there with what's going to take place in the last days. And the Lord's going to take one and leave one behind. According to this passage, this event happens at a time when life is going on as normal and people are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, buying and selling, planting and selling, planting and building. Uh, none of those things are wrong in themselves, they're everyday normal life. But the picture there is of life going on as normal, then suddenly destruction comes upon them. Uh, this image actually gives some credence to the pre-tribulation rapture view because when you get to the end of the tribulation, then things will not be going on as normal. There will be a very abnormal society. I could say, actually, we've got a pretty abnormal society ourselves at the moment. But it's relatively normal in that people still continue to do those things. And we say that uh, at this time, there's going to be people living as normal. Then suddenly, one will be taken, one will be left. Uh, one will be taken to be with the Lord, one will be left behind for judgment. Interesting, the word which is used for taken is in Greek word paralambeno, uh, which means to be taken alongside someone and implies to be taken to a good place, a safe place. It's a word which Jesus uses in John 14 where he says, I will come again, I will take you to myself. So this taking is a taking out of the world to be with Jesus, to be with himself. The word for left is aphiemi, which implies being left behind to judgment in a bad place. And... Uh, so I believe that this is speaking about the taking of the believer, of the saved person, to be with the Lord at the event which we call the rapture of the church. Uh, we see also that there are parallels in Matthew's Gospel. And in Matthew's Gospel, at the end of the uh, description of this, Matthew says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, an unexpected hour. If you follow through the events of the Great Tribulation and the second coming of Christ to the earth, if you manage to survive to the end of the Tribulation period, you've seen the mark of the beast set up at the midpoint of the Tribulation. You see the armies of the world gathering together, for Armageddon, then you see the darkness 
uh, coming on the earth, uh, would it be surprising if the next thing which happens is that Jesus comes? I think it would not be. Even, as even in Revelation 6, it says even the unbelievers, when they see these things happening, are going to cry to the Lord, to the rocks fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. So it'll be at that time people will know that uh, Jesus is coming. Whereas this passage here, it seems to be that life is just going on as normal, then suddenly one's taken, one is left. Life going on as normal and being taken to be with the Lord. It's also interesting in Luke, it says that one will be uh, two men in a bed, one taken, one left, two women grinding together. Matthew, it says two women in the mill, one will be taken, one left, two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. If you think about it, this covers all the bases, all the different possibilities. Uh, we know now that uh, at any 24-hour period in Earth's history, uh, half the world is in darkness and half the world is in light. If they're in darkness, they're likely to be asleep in a bed. Uh, and so he says here about there'll be two people sleeping in the same room, perhaps, or in the same house. One will be taken, one will be left. The believer will be taken, the unbeliever will be left behind. In the part of the world where people are alive, uh, awake, sorry, people are awake, uh, they may be working inside or they may be outside. Uh, doesn't matter if you're inside or you're outside. Uh, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, you're going to be caught up to meet with the Lord and to be with him. So it doesn't matter if you're asleep or awake, if you're inside or if you're outside. If you believe in Jesus, that'll be the, cate the criteria which will uh, make you ready for the coming of the Lord. And again, Matthew tells us to be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So to be ready all the time. And if you do take the pre-tribulation view, then that is an incentive to people to be ready all the time to meet with the Lord, because he could come any time. And he could come before I finish tweaking this, giving this talk. But he'll come at his time and in his way. Uh, some people actually told me that Jesus is going to come back in 2021. Well, I don't know that because we don't know the day or the hour. But we are to be ready at all times for the coming of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> in verse 37, uh, they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. <clears throat> An interesting phrase this, and one which is uh, a little difficult to interpret. Um, have the same image in Matthew, but as I'm going to say, there's one slight difference in Matthew. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, uh, the word for body is the word soma. Soma. It's the ordinary word for body. It's used 145 times in the New Testament. It's the word Jesus uses about his body when he says, this is my body which is given for you. It's the word Paul uses when he speaks about the body of Christ. When he speaks about one body, one spirit, uh, he uses the word soma. So it's a positive image, a positive word. Uh, if you go to Matthew, the equivalent passage there, he uses a different word in Greek, which is potoma. And potoma actually means a dead body or a corpse. It's only used uh, in other, two other places in the New Testament. One of uh, the disciples of John the Baptist going to take his dead body after Herod has beheaded him to bury him. It's also used in, of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 12, uh, when the two witnesses are lying in the street and their dead bodies are left lying in the street before they are resurrected and taken to be with the Lord. Uh, both places use the word potoma, so it means a dead body. Whereas the word used here is a soma, which is a living body. Ordinary word for, for a body. The word used for eagle in both Matthew and in Luke is the word aitos. Uh, now, in the Bible, the, the eagle generally tends to be a positive ver, uh, bird. Uh, in fact, in Revelation chapter uh, 4, you have the four living creatures who are around the throne of God, the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. <coughs> and they're saying, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and pr praising God, Revelation chapter 4. The lion, the highest of the animals, wild animals, the calf, the highest of the domestic animals, man, the highest of God's creation, and the eagle, the highest of the flying animals, flying creatures. <clears throat> the highest of God's creations, if you like. Revelation 12, uh, God carries the woman, representing Israel, on eagle's wings to a place of safety. 
Uh, in Deuteronomy 20, 32, you also have Israel uh, and it uses the figure of speech, if you like, of God carrying Israel on eagles' wings out of Egypt uh, to the promised land. God carrying his people out of Egypt in the Exodus. Uh, eagles actually don't eat carrion, they don't eat dead bodies, but vultures do. And if you look at some of the translations in Matthew, particularly uses the vultures rather than the eagles. In fact, one of the translations I looked at uses the word vultures here in Luke as well. Uh, vultures, of course, are an unclean bird and not a pleasant bird. They feed on dead uh, meat and dead animals found in the desert. And if you leave a, if a, a creature dies in the desert, uh, the vultures will gather around it and feed upon it. So we have to ask the question, what, is, what did Jesus actually mean by this? And I thought about this, there are two possible meanings. One is a positive image, that the body is the body of Jesus, and the eagles are carrying the redeemed church out of the place of judgment to be with Jesus at the rapture of the church, flying on eagles' wings out of the place of judgment to meet him in the air, in Luke's Gospel. If you go to Matthew, then it could be a negative sign of the attraction of the vulture to a corpse, implying that when you see the negative things happening, the judgments on the earth, they're a sign that it's ready for the second coming of Jesus. So you can make your choice on that one. I like the idea that uh, the eagles being gathered together is actually a picture of us being gathered together to meet with the Lord at the uh, rapture of the church, being taken on eagles' wings out of this place of judgment to be with the Lord, uh, to be with his body and have our bodies changed like unto his glorious body. <coughs> but... Those are, we can't say for sure that that's what he means, but it's an interesting possibility that uh, came to me when I looked at this, particularly in the Gospel of Luke. Whatever one you take, the signs are happening. And I believe we're living in the time of the signs, the time when Jesus is coming back again. In Luke 21, Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. When you see the things which are happening now, the signs of the troubles on the earth, the famines, the wars, the, even the plague, the pestilence, all these things taking place, restoration of Israel, troubles around the Middle East, particularly around Jerusalem. When you see these things beginning to take place, then they're signs of the second coming of Jesus. And he, Jesus is the great hope that we have for the future. And the Bible makes it clear to us that Jesus will come. He'll come this time not as the suffering servant, but this time as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He will establish then a visible kingdom. He will rule from David's throne in Jerusalem and he will bring peace and justice to the earth. And it will be a physical change which will take place to the earth even as Jesus reigns in the millennial kingdom period after his second coming. <clears throat> and this will be a place where all the believers from all ages who will be resurrected will have a part to play. Believers from the Old Testament part, from the New Testament part, those who are killed during the tribulation and those who have come to faith in Jesus or come to saving faith in the Lord throughout from the beginning of time to the end of time and because of this we have a glorious future and a glorious hope and so Jesus says when you see these things begin to happen look up your heads lift up look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near Jesus is coming and there is a great hope for the future for all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so there will be a physical, a physical kingdom, we look forward to that, but now we also rejoice in the invisible kingdom of God, which we're born again into through faith in Jesus, as we know God living within us by his Holy Spirit, and we look forward to God coming in person in Jesus, when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. <coughs>